Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Community Connections on Seniors and Nutrition. I would like to introduce Jill Erickson, who is a registered dietitian and manager with Stanislaus County Aging and Veterans Services for over 20 years. She is a graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a BS in Dietetics and Nutrition Sciences, a dietetic internship at the University of Indiana Hospitals in Indianapolis, and she's currently responsible for the oversight of elder nutrition plans, senior meals, senior information and assistance, and high cap Medicare programs. Just as a reminder, you can enter questions into the chat box. The video is being recorded and may be found at our Community Hospice YouTube channel. Jill, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome, Thank everybody. You. And uh, for those that will listen later, welcome. Thank you for having me, Kristen, and the Community Hospice team. Um, so today I'm going to go ahead and move the slide forward. Um, I call this Eat Well, Age Well. And really, it just is some ba basic nutrition um, information about what's important as you age well with nutrition. So this first slide kind of just talks about specifically some of the, the most common things you'll see as we get older. And I'm in that group. I'm 57 now and heading toward the, the 60s. So every decade, it seems that uh, there's new challenges. So and I'll try and make reference to different age groups as I go through. But there are unique needs as we age. And some of those is because as we get older, um, you, you have a higher risk of having high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, um, heart disease, and diabetes, of course. Those are the chronic health conditions. So there's a more higher rate of having those as we get older. So diet becomes a very intricate part of, of watching how to manage those diseases. So we'll go through a little bit of those as we go through the slides. Um, also, for the very, I call it the, the advanced age, Sometimes, you know, it's, it's not just you're eating specific for a condition, but a lot of times you're eating less as you get older, especially into the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Those are lucky enough to be in the 90s. So that's when protein, if you see the second tab, becomes really important. So for those people who have a lower total caloric intake, protein becomes a very significant thing you want to focus on making sure you get enough of. Of course, that's the meat and eggs and so forth. Um, and then nutrients, specific nutrients. Um, potassium, for example, a lot of people focus on reduced sodium in their diet, but potassium, getting enough potassium is almost as important, especially with things like blood pressure. And calcium and vitamin D, of course, are very common uh, nutrients we don't get enough of. And as each decade goes on and your bone density and your, your risk of osteoporosis grows, especially for women, um, that becomes very important to make sure you have um, in your diet. Let me see here. And I'm going to touch a little bit about water as we go through the slides too, because dehydration can become more common as well, and the risk for dehydration, because it's hard to just remember to get enough to drink sometimes. Okay, so of course, maintaining a healthy weight is the goal for all of us. Okay, so oftentimes it can be put this simply um, eat the good stuff first. You know, where do I begin? Um, and I have to even remind myself to do this because I, uh, full confession here, have a, a sweet tooth. <laughs> so uh, someone said to me, well, you know, what do you do? And they said, I eat the good stuff first. And I think that's probably the best tip. And I, I hope that you can keep that in mind. If we do that, if we all concentrate on just eating the foods that we know are nutritious first, you're making sure we get them in our diet, then we don't have to focus so much on avoiding the bad stuff because that will kind of come naturally. There's a couple things that I really wanted to um, focus on. Some special tips that I see people having shortages of in their diet or not thinking enough about. And the first one here is fiber. Um, so when you think of fiber, a lot of people think of whole grains and that's, that's a very important part, but fruits and vegetables have a significant amount of fiber. And on your left of your screen, you're seeing tips about um, dietary fiber in general. Why is it important? And, uh, you know, our bowel and bladder becomes very, very important and getting enough water and fiber is a big part of being regular. So it reduces constipation, it lowers cholesterol, helps with blood sugar control and helps with your satiety or feeling full. So that helps you with maintaining a healthy weight. On the right side of the screen, just a little tips about what's a soluble fiber and an insoluble fiber, but a lot of food has both. 
The main point is that these are both good sources of fiber in your diet. Uh, for some people that might be avoiding gluten, I know that's pretty common these days or more and more common. Uh, there's good sources of fiber in rice, quinoa, popcorn and corn in general. Oats is one of those things you might not tolerate, you, you may tolerate, but they, they typically avoid wheat and rye. Um, so, and bran. So these are just some, there's ways to get fiber in your diet without having gluten in there, if that's something that you try to avoid. So as we go through, just remember you're trying to get good sources of fiber, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, legumes, pretty straightforward. Um, another thing about calcium and vitamin D, again, especially for um, women because of the osteoporosis connection, on the left side of the screen, I'm just pointing out the obvious, right? What's calcium, the high sources of uh, calcium in your diet, uh, of course, are milk, cheese, and yogurt, the picture you see in the middle, that's gonna be your primary source. But there, are some, there is some calcium in spinach and kale, dark greens, soybeans, white beans. Sometimes uh, you can get calcium from the actual bones, like in the sardines and in the fish. That's actual bones. Those, those are, when you eat the bone, you're getting that calcium. It's helpful for you. And then they fortify some foods. You might've seen in the grocery store, orange juice fortified with calcium, milk. Sometimes the lactose-free versions, the part that doesn't have any of the milk sugar, those will actually be fortified or have added calcium to help us get to those calcium goals. On the right side of the screen, you're seeing vitamin D sources. Again, the fatty fishes, the foods that are fortified with vitamin D, liver, some cheeses and egg yolk have the vitamin D. Um, and we want them together. So those sources, again, the dairy is probably gonna be the number one, vitamin D and calcium together. Most milks are fortified with vitamin D and calcium. The, the calcium might be natural, but they add the vitamin D. And that's what you want for the, the best bone strength and absorption. So just a tip to make sure you're getting that, make effort. Um, and there, again, there are good choices. If you're lactose intolerant, you don't normally drink milk. There's lactose-free lactate. You've probably seen that in the grocery store. And another product that's very popular that I like to recommend people try if you don't like regular milk or have some GI disturbance with milk is called Fairlife. Uh, Fairlife milk is not lact, is lactose free, but because it's ultra pasteurized, ultra, ultra filtrated. So it's a little bit of a different product. And if you've tried the lactate milks and you don't like them, I think you might enjoy the, the Fairlife milk as a good option if you have problems with lactose. And then I'm just going to focus on A and C, just like in the school lunches, uh, our nutrition programs here focus on making sure we get you good sources of vitamin A and vitamin C. And they say vitamin C every day. I'm sorry, this picture is not turning out too well on the screen, but uh, vitamin C, and you, some of you I'm sure are familiar with that, the citrus fruits, the oranges, the grapefruit, lemons and limes, those all have a really good source of vitamin C. But a lot of people don't realize that some, a lot of the berries do as well, like strawberries and blueberries. Peppers, green and red peppers. I, find, I love fajitas, my gosh. You know, <laughs> those things really are wonderful sources of vitamin C. And you're seeing some things like broccoli and spinach. Um, another thing is tomatoes. Again, an excellent source of vitamin C. Now on the vitamin A rich foods, a lot of those are the carotenoids. They're precursors to vitamin A. But regardless, it's going to help you to make enough vitamin A uh, in your system. And the dark colored vegetables, the bright orange and the dark green are really going to be your best sources. So you, I'm sure most people are familiar with carrots being a very good source of vitamin A. But you see the sweet potatoes on there, apricots, cantaloupe. So that orange, dark orange color. Again, the peppers are on there. So you can see a lot of these foods have both vitamin A and vitamin C um, and spinach. Probably the, I call the superfoods, carrots and spinach. If you can get those in your diet a few times a week, we recommend two to three times a week, a real good source of vitamin A. And every day, having something with some vitamin C um, is a, just a good general rule to get the kind of vitamins you'd like to have in your diet. Plus again, fiber. So for those of you that say, hey, I really want to dive in and I'd like some more specific nutrition guidelines for, for myself with my lifestyle, with my height, my weight, and my activity level, I would really like to recommend you go to this uh, website. So myplate.gov, and you can see in the right corner, 
my plate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that most of you are already familiar with this. Some remember the old uh, uh, triangle, uh, the pyramid, so to speak, of the food guidelines. Nowadays, we really use my plate for nutrition education. And it's just a better graphic on trying to show you that really we want fruits and vegetables to make up half of your diet, right? Um, and that's a, that's a lofty goal for a lot of folks. But the more you try to, again, choose the right, you know, the good stuff first, and you just make a conscious effort to include some fruits and vegetables every day, you're doing, you're doing well. So just, I think that conceptualizes really well what we're trying to do with the grains and the protein, fruits and vegetables. But a My Plate plan, you can actually go to this website from the USDA, and it will help you get an individualized plan. It will ask you a series of questions and give you some, some more specific guidelines just for you. So it's a wonderful resource I just wanted to share. And I think that this presentation will be posted later on the community hospice website. So you can come and, and recheck re this if you don't simply just search that myplate.gov and I think you can find this MyPlate plan for future reference if you want more specific information to help you. So I'm gonna move away from food a little bit and focus again on water. Uh, I can't help, but uh, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about constipation or bowel and bladder, but as people get older and as people get less active, this becomes uh, a big factor. Um, so in people that might experience some incontinence, avoid drinking that puts them at risk of dehydration. So I always wanna bring it back um, for the older adults, especially those of the band stage, to really focus on water and make sure you're not overlooking the water, your water needs. And we you know how much water you need is kind of controversial. Um, this, if you see in the upper right corner, it says the eight by eight. That's one of those old standard, get eight glasses of water, eight, eight ounces glasses of water every day. Uh, and if you did your research online, you would see that for men and women, a lot of people recommend specific 13 cups for beverages for men and nine cups for women. So um, either one of these is, is very accurate, but I do like to preface that with, um, you know, you might be a, not, you know, an 80 year old female that weighs 90 pounds, and this is going to be a lot of water for you. Okay, so you can't say that the 200 pound man and the 90, you know, 90 pound woman need the same amount of water. Uh, so it's just a good rule that eight by eight is going to keep you safe. And if you're a very small uh, person under 100 pounds, and you're drinking six glasses of water a day, I, I, there's a very good chance you're getting plenty of fluids. Uh, so I hope that helps put that in perspective. Uh, but these are great tips on the left. Do you see that? Uh, drink water when you're not thirsty, whatever that might be for you. I mean, jello okay, would count as a fluid. It really just breaks down. So if you really can't get yourself to do it, your milk, your, your, uh, your uh, let me see, juices, your water, anything that's a fluid is going to help you with a little special note. If you look on the bottom there, that those things that contain caffeine, uh, so the sodas that contain caffeine and coffee uh, kind of count against you and alcohol in general, those are actually diuretics. So even though they're fluids, they have a little bit of a diuretic effect. So those of you that might have problems with incontinence, that might just make that worse. So we want you to get your fluids with that thought in mind to try and keep away from foods, or excuse me, beverages that don't have caffeine and alcohol limit those as much as possible. They, they kind of don't have the desired effect, right, on your, on your fluid needs. And if anyone has questions, if you're on there, you can certainly stop me at any time and ask a specific question, and I'll take questions at the end as well. Hope I'm not going too fast here. <laughs> Another special slide I wanted to take a moment to touch on is about diabetes. So this is one of the things I think are most common besides heart disease and just having a good heart healthy diet, I get most questions about diabetes. Um, so the important thing to remember is having a plan for your diet and your meals is really important in keeping your, your blood sugar levels and your target range. And what is it? What is a good plan? So a good plan isn't just about the diet, but it's going to take into into consideration your lifestyle or your activity levels, because that also has an effect not only on your calorie needs, but on how your, your uh, blood sugar levels are gonna react, um, as well as the medicines you're taking. So diabetes has so many factors and so many issues that can make a difference in your blood sugar levels. 
that you really should um, take the time to speak to someone. And if you see this box I put in here, a diabetes educator, uh, if you're on medication for diabetes and you've been diagnosed with diabetes, I hope that your physician has directed you to get some extra education from a diabetes educator. There are certified diabetes educators that are nurses and certified diabetes education educators that are dietitians, and both are good choices. They've gone through specific training so that they know the medications very well. They understand the physiology of the exercise and your activity levels, your sleep, and how that affects your blood sugar and can help advise you overall about how you can eat and exercise and be active or whatever your lifestyle might be and how that's gonna affect your blood sugars and get you in, in line. On the right-hand side, you can see just some general tips. I'm not trying to definitely give you a diabetes, uh, uh, that would take an entire uh, session to talk about diabetes and if you were insulin dependent or if you're just on oral medications, et cetera. But you can see the tips here will say, I'm gonna move my own screen here. I can't see my own screen. Nope, I'm, I'm going backwards. Making sure that you, includes, you, you, you include foods that are low on those simple sugars and have whole grains with the fiber because that helps uh, absorb. So it helps slow the absorption of sugars in your, in your system. And make sure that you have non-starchy uh, vegetables than starchy vegetables. So you see, I put, they put broccoli and spinach and green beans. A starchy vegetable, it works just like a bread. It's like having another simple sugar. Uh, starchy vegetables would be potatoes and corn, peas. So you have to kind of learn a little bit about your food sources and what carbohydrates are in them. Uh, I don't like to hear when people say they just avoid carbohydrates because of course there's, there's so many good carbohydrates and good fiber sources. You don't want to do that, right? You just want to make sure you understand the simple versus the complex and make sure you, you're controlling how much you have at each meal. So focus on whole foods instead of highly processed foods as much as possible, making sure that you're getting that fiber in there. And if you're, you're eating the fresh fruits and vegetables, you're, you're well on your way um, to making sure you have good nutrition overall and, and it has some of that fiber in there. So the takeaway from the people who have diabetes that are on this call is I hope you've taken the time to be, um, you know, to seek, seek out a diabetes educator and really get a good plan in there that includes all those things, not just your food and your meals, but your lifestyle, as well as the medications that you're taking. Okay. So I also wanted to kind of take a moment for those folks in the audience that might be facing or struggling with just the opposite, right? We know a lot of us struggle with eating too much or, or not eating well. But there's folks that, you know, struggling, they might be going through some sort of treatment, or it might just be even depression, as you see my picture here, can really affect your appetite. Nausea, if you have some treatments that might affect that too, can off be off-putting and people just don't get enough to eat. And after a time, that just suppresses your immunity, your strength, everything about you, your quality of life can be affected. So this is a big deal about not getting enough to eat. And I wanted to kind of touch on some real simple tips and some of the things that I've used in my previous life as a clinician in the hospital setting uh, on how to maybe try some different things to get enough food when, it's, when you're struggling to eat and get enough nutrition. So one of the first things I say to people who are trying to lose weight is to take all the calories out of the things you drink. Just drink you know, total calorie-free things, which is water, right? Uh, tea can be another thing that has uh, no calories, but it's really that simple. You will reduce your caloric intake greatly if you avoid beverages that have calories. So the opposite is true when you're trying to put weight on, when you're trying to get enough calories. Make sure that what you're drinking for liquids, if you can, all have calories. And of course, one of those things most popular is one of the nutrition supplements you've, you've heard, I'm sure, of Insure or Boost. Those are high calorie beverages. Uh, that make it a little bit like it. Some people do it as a supplement in between meals or as a, as a meal substitute. But the idea is, of course, is to take that in between meals, um, ideally, to just try and get extra calories. Make that your beverage. Uh, I like to point out, here's that picture of that Fairlife milk that I talked about a little earlier. If it's a whole milk, it comes in a red container versus the blue um, low-fat milk. And this is the time, the people who are not getting enough calories that are struggling with weight loss and maintaining their weight, 
uh, when you, hey, don't, there's no rules anymore. Drink the whole milk. <laughs> Add the gravy and the butter. This is the time when you're trying to get as many calories as possible because you're eating so little. Uh, so fair life milk is that lactose free because of the ultra filtration. It's actually higher in protein than normal milk and it won't upset you with GI. If you have GI problems with gas or bloating or, or diarrhea, when you drink milk for those people that are lactose intolerant, fair life is gonna help you. And lactate is another choice if you've seen those milks out there. Um, I put in here carnation and some breakfast, if you can see that. Although it does have some dried milk powder in it, if you mix it with the lactose-free milks, uh, it's just better accepted by a lot of patients uh, than, the, than the insure boost, not as medicine-y. So it's a nice substitute to, to try and get a supplement another way than the insure or the boost uh, by adding uh, milk to your carnation and some breakfast. And again, I would use a whole milk if I'm trying to get the most calories out of there, right? That's a powder that you just add. Um, if you guys remember Ovaltine, that's really taken the years back, right? Those powder mixes to get good nutrition. It's like having a vitamin and extra protein and calcium in your milk. It makes it higher in calories for you. So other tips, you know, ice cream puddings and smoothie. Mocha mix is a high calorie lactose-free um, beverage that you can find and they make an ice cream. So these are just some tips on how to get more calories in if you're going through that kind of an issue. Uh, the only thing I think I didn't say is when you are having some nausea, if you're actively going through not nausea issues, um, I recommend trying to, to just eat cold foods. Sometimes the smell of hot foods when it's cooking or the odor of those foods can trigger nausea and vomiting. So cold food sometimes will help in that situation too. So for those of you in the audience that might be struggling, I hope this is helpful for you. Okay. Now I have to uh, take a moment and uh, plug a little bit about the senior nutrition program. <laughs> That's what I'm doing now in, the, in my career. I've been working with the senior meals program for quite a while. And I wanted to touch base on, you know, when you're eating uh, and you live alone, a lot of seniors who might be living alone or even as a couple, uh, we just the smaller family size, it's just harder to, to cook as often. You might go more for convenience foods and you might not be taking the time to um, do a lot of fresh foods. Uh, I get it. Some, you know, when my kids went away uh, in the empty nester, that all changes, right? Now it's just a smaller number of people. So I like to plug the senior luncheon program that we have. It's a senior lunch. It's just for older adults. Our programming comes from the federal government called the Older Americans Act. And this program is just, I, I can't say enough about it because it's really a social lunch. The part about being socialization and having an, uh, an opportunity to just gather together to have lunch is so powerful of a thing. So this isn't just about us making a, a nutritious meal for the seniors. It's about people coming together and enjoying mealtime together. So I hope that if, if none of you have already experienced the, the, the senior lunch program, on the left-hand side of your screen, you're gonna see that we are all over the county in Staslas County. The Modesto Senior Center. Mancini Hall is by where the Modesto Nuts used to play uh, on Tuolumne Boulevard. Um, the Veterans Center here at Coffee and Sylvan is where I work, that's where our offices are. And we have a new Veterans Hall right next door and we have a, a lunch program there. The Riverbank Community Center. Oakdale has a senior center. It's a beautiful center, the Gladys Lemon Center. Houston, as you can see, Ceres is a new site that's just starting uh, the first year, the first week of May. The Ceres Community Center for the first time is gonna have our lunch program. The Turlock Salvation Army at Newman, they have a McConnell Center. They don't actually have a senior center in, in Newman, but they have a little center there called McConnell. The Hammond Senior Center in Patterson. And Wesley Grayson area, we've got something called the United Community Center out on Laird Road. So you can see there's a lot of opportunities through the entire county to find a, a luncheon program. And the best part about this program is the only eligibility is that you're 60 or older. Uh, again, this isn't a, a soup kitchen meal. This isn't for low income folks. This is for seniors. And it's the most important thing is that it's a social outlet and that you don't have to cook and you don't have to clean. <laughs> so you're all invited as the sign says to come enjoy, try the senior lunch program. Um, on this slide, this is a picture, actually, I believe, of the Houston site. 
some of the seniors uh, enjoying the lunch program there. Typically, the, the lunch runs from 10 to 1 o'clock, but we serve usually at between 11 and 12. Some of them vary a little bit site to site. Again, 60 or older. That doesn't mean you have to be you have to be 60 to come. And everyone is welcome. But if you're under 60 years of age, you do have to pay the full cost of the price of the meal, which is six dollars. If you're 60 or older, it's really just a suggested donation. We we ask for three dollars a meal, but you give what you can of your own accord, and no one would be turned away who's eligible. No 60 year old has to donate at all if they're not able to or, or choose not to. We do encourage reservations. And you can call our senior information line at that number at the bottom here on the left, the 558-8698. And they can give you information about all of these sites, where they are, what days of the week. Some of them are three days a week and some of them run Monday through Friday. So you do need to get more specific information about the lunch sites. But in general, you, you get the idea. It's a fun, affordable lunch. Who can, uh, where could you go now to get a lunch for $3? and bring a friend, right? You know, um, it's a wonderful way to get out and, and enjoy a lunch. I have to put a tip in for the Modesto Senior Center. On Wednesdays, um, they have a movie, movie day every Wednesday. So following the lunch program, they have movie and a popcorn machine. So you can go out to lunch and stay for a movie. <laughs> so it's an important part of good nutrition is getting together and being social and enjoying the time, uh, the lunch time. I'm gonna show you a sample of the menu here on the next slide, just to get full, because you can't um, really draw people into the lunch program unless you really know what you're, you're getting yourself into here. So they might have some simple meals like a hamburger with coleslaw and barbecue beans. And then they have things like a curried chicken salad, uh, chicken and potatoes and salad. We always use fruit for dessert. Uh, you can see that uh, we try to do some cultural foods with uh, chicken and rice or arroz con pollo, uh, coleslaw, mixed vegetables. Some of these, you see these little cross marks. So we also try to identify the foods that are giving you a good source of vitamin C and the asterisk is the good source of vitamin A. So it's a way of showing you that we plan these menus. They're all approved by a registered dietitian and planned by a dietitian to make sure we're making, you're getting more vegetables here than I'm sure you would do planning your own meals at home. So that's the, the bonus of coming to one of the lunch sites is that you're going to get a variety of good foods and you can always plan ahead on what your favorite items are so you can come on the popular days. <laughs> so I hope that it, you uh, people out there pass this on to others as well and do join us for lunch. I, I can't go by without also probably discussing a little bit about uh, the biggest program we have in our county, which is the home delivered meals or what people call the Meals on Wheels programs. So Meals on Wheels, the National Association like to say it's, it's more than just a meal. And you can see the three things it's saying. It's, it's a nutritional food, of course, but it's also someone stopping by and checking on you to say hello and just that little bit of moment of time. So in our county, some counties are a little bit different. For the majority of people in our county, we now have just a one day a week delivery of five frozen meals. The picture you see here with the box shows a sample of an entree, uh, the milks, juice, a loaf of bread, and some fruit cups in there. If, if you, think, you can see, I think it's probably an applesauce in there. It could be just a mixed fruit. In the, uh, in the middle of there, you see a delivery driver sample with a box. So it's providing the adequate nutrition for folks that are maybe not cooking or not getting out very often. And a big part of this is being homebound. A big part of the eligibility now is not just that you're 60 or older, but that you're homebound. What we call primarily homebound, meaning that you, you can't get out on a, on a regular basis due to some physical or cognitive issue. You're getting out on a very limited basis. You either don't drive at all, or it's so restricted that uh, we try to allow for those, uh, I call them the stubborn seniors that maybe are still driving that their families uh, don't want them to be driving, but it's only to the store down the street a mile up. So we don't want to eliminate them from being eligible because we, we want to, um, you know, be able to provide them extra meals without them having to go out when they don't want to go out. So we call that primarily homebound. Um, the idea is that they're home most of the time. If they get out on a regular basis, if you're leaving your home on a regular basis or other people in your household drive, 
then you wouldn't qualify for home delivery. We would want to instead encourage you to go, to, of course, to one of the luncheon sites. And there's usually a level of frailty. So one deficiency in what we call activities of daily living. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Uh, that's basically your, your ability to uh, walk, transfer, dress yourself, bathe yourself, and, and use the restroom on your own. How, how, much, how independent you are on doing those things. So most, the majority of our home delivery clients have some level of frailty. And the most common is in walking. They might use a cane or a walker um, or even a wheelchair. So they, it's difficult for them because they're of their frail condition uh, to, to travel, to get out, to, to be you know, out and getting um, their meals on their own or cooking on their own. And that's why the home delivered meals are here for them. So home delivered meals is the same criteria. You just have to be that 60 or older, but again, have some level of frailty and be homebound. We get a lot of questions. If anyone has questions, they can certainly call me or um, the home, our main senior information line, which I'm gonna give again at the end of the slip green, but I'm hoping that you're familiar with this uh, senior information directory. We call it our pink information directory. And our 558-8698 number is on the front of this for any questions you might have about senior services. And I'll give that number to you at the end as well. But that's how you can call about home delivered meals and how to get set up on home delivered meals if that's something you're interested in. If anybody's got questions, let me know. Otherwise I'll wait here till I'm just about finished with my presentation thus far. So who, again, who we are, we are Stanislaus County Aging and Veterans Services. Um, I'm the manager for the aging services side, but we're co-located with the Veterans Service Office. So oftentimes we, we like to make sure that people who are veterans also know about some of the benefits that are available to them because we're one county department. But I am representing what we call an area agency on aging. And the state is divided into 32 different area agencies on aging. Um, so we are all run through the California Department of Aging, providing a, a bunch of different services um, for older adults and including the senior meals programs, of course. Uh, but Medicare help, help connecting to in-home help, uh, transportation questions, Medicare. So when you have any questions about services for older adults, I hope you think of us, the senior information line, again, that 558-8698 number. And we want to connect you. We're here to help. If we don't have the services that we provide directly, we know the other um, organizations that provide services and we'll make sure you get connected to the right place. That's our website at agingservices.info, or you can go to the county website and look up Area Agency on Aging or Aging and Veteran Services, and you'll find us that way as well. Um, so that's, I know I kind of went through a lot of information in a hurry. Um, I'm hoping that you, uh, have questions, or if you have questions, you think about them later. I know this again will be posted on the website, and you can certainly reach out um, to me there. In the, I will make sure I put in the chat my direct contact information. Again, my name is Jill Erickson. I'm a manager with Aging and Veterans Services, a registered dietitian, and you know want to be here to help. Our main service is connecting seniors to services and caregivers to services. We have programs to help just the caregiver who are taking care of older adults. Um, and I know it's a, uh, there's a lot of factors in the good health and nutrition of seniors in general. And these are just some of the tips to help in those ways. But again, there's a lot of other resources out there. So if uh, food is ever an issue, there's the commodity program, food banks, there's uh, the Cal Fresh, what we used to call, uh, 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 what am I trying to think? Cal Fresh uh, food stamps. They call it CalFresh now. Um, so there's a lot of food resources and a lot of good nutrition resources. We have another agency called Healthy Aging that even has specific uh, distribution of just fresh fruits and vegetables out there. So please call us if there's a way we can help you connect to get adequate food, information about other services, or just nutrition questions in general, I'd be glad to help as well. So thank you for having me, Kristen. Let me know if there's anything else I can do here, and I'll, I'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions. No, you did an amazing job. Priscilla's going to wrap things up for us. I'll have you go ahead and move the next slide to 
to our next um, oh, sure. uh, topic just so that people can see that. There were a few questions, so I'll let Priscilla go ahead and introduce those. And then I did um, want to make sure um, to share that I did add um, a PDF, a link to the Senior Awareness Day poster, as well as your Senior Lunch um, Program flyer into the chat box. So for those that are joining us, and you have access to that information as well by clicking on those links. Thank you for doing that, Crystal. I completely forgot that we are <laughs> having a special event. Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe we have a little reminder note here. Yeah. So uh, on May 26th at the Modesto Library, and I'm glad you have a reference that on your on your site uh, in the chat box, the uh, connection to that. Um, it's an event where we have, uh, we'll be in the library foyer right next to the farmer's market. And there will be booths and tables about all types of informational services for seniors. The senior lunch program people will be there, the Medicare folks, and a lot of community partners like senior law, Catholic charities, all kinds of groups from the transportation to every service you can imagine. So uh, it's a free event. We're hoping to have our farmer's market, what we call coupons uh, to distribute out to uh, seniors that have moderate income or, or less. We can give them coupons to get free fruits and vegetables that day. So come on out, learn a lot about senior services and uh, enjoy the farmer's market on that same day. It's a Thursday market on May 26th. And then the senior um, lunch flyer that has more information about the different locations and services. So thank you for that, Kristen. Okay, Jill, there were a couple of questions here. Uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you were discussing soluble versus insoluble fiber. What is the difference? So it's really the source. So soluble, so insoluble, it's just a type of fiber. And most foods, as I said before, have both. So um, insoluble fibers, you probably have, uh, you see the Quaker oat commercials, those are an insoluble, a lot of uh, apples is probably another good source of insoluble fiber. So the, the um, it's just an indigestible fiber. Uh, some of them are, uh, in, in when they say insolvable, they, they just don't dissolve in water. Um, so that, but all fibers are not digestible. So they, they go through your system and that's the benefit is they help with, again, lowering cholesterol. They bind a lot of fat and cholesterol. They, they help with um, just, oh, you've heard that, it'll say eat your roughage, that's fiber, right? <laughs> it helps with regularity. Um, it helps with so many things and diabetes. So both sources of fiber, the, the, the insoluble fiber is gonna be your more coarse grains, your whole grains. So it's really just the food source, but both are good and both are important and have those same benefits. Thank you. And then when you were talking about the senior luncheon, if there's seniors that are from other counties that are maybe visiting, are they welcome to the join the luncheon? Thank you, that's a great question. Yes. Um, what we do to uh, uh, avoid that and, you know, is that we just use the site. We tell them, because uh, we do have a registration. We have a registration of the senior when they come in. So we like to know we get a, their date of birth, for example, just to verify that they're eligible, right? And they give us their address. But we will, the site, if they don't want to give us their address for some reason, or they live out of our county as a guest, we just use the site address. So all are welcome. Um, we do want to, of course, make our primary target the people who live in our county, but we don't want to uh, dissuade any guests from coming. <laughs> so they are welcome. And if they're 60 or older, the, the eligibility still applies. I should note, I'm, I'm glad you're talking about eligibility, because um, one of the things I like to mention is that a, a spouse of any age is also welcome. So when you have that, uh, I might be 60 and have a 40-year-old husband. You just never know. <laughs> and my husband would be eligible so that would still be a suggested donation for my so a spouse of any age to a senior who's 60 or older it has the same eligibility they also are just a voluntary contribution and and the same would be for a, a disabled adult child residing with this senior so say i have a i may be 70 but i have a 50 year old uh, disabled child that has been a special needs child my whole life living with me and if we go together to the lunch site, that disabled adult um, child is eligible for the lunch as well. Thank you. Uh, there is another question here. It says, uh, which milk is most nutritional if someone is lactose intolerant? Would it be soy, almond, oat milk? Oh, good questions. So they all have a lot of uh, benefits. And, and I, you know, honestly, on the, the soy, I have to, to look. 
Um, so you might get, you'll see that in the, the fair life milk, for example, that's going to be the highest source of protein. So it really depends on what you're focusing on. If you're looking for mostly calcium or if you're looking for protein or both. Um, so you're going to have to do some label reading to make sure uh, which is which is going to be best for you. But most of those are going to be fortified to the same kind of levels. But uh, Fair Life, I haven't seen any that are uh, that have as much protein that that is in the Fair Life milk, which is again lactose free because it's ultra pasteurized. So you know you've got to go with a couple things. Which one are you really going to drink, right? Which one? <laughs> so that's the one you want. Uh, and make sure it is fortified with calcium because a lot of those milks are not going to naturally have calcium. Um, and other than that, because I, I would say, for example, lactate milk is not as high in calcium, but they have one that is fortified in calcium. So there's choices there. And you're going to have to see which tastes best for you, which you, you, know, you like the best and has the best nutrient level. I hope that helps. Thank you, Jill. Are there any other questions? Hi, this is Carmen. I do have one more question. You mentioned sweet potatoes earlier. Potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Um, oh, sweet potatoes. Are they, um, is the nutritional value the same for both sweet potatoes and yams? Oh, that is a good question. You know, I, I actually, I'd have to look that up to be specific for you. They're gonna be very, very close. Um, but I, I, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking sweet potatoes has just a little bit more of the vitamin A or carotenoids equivalents. They call them retinol equivalents, uh, but they're both gonna be excellent choices. I mean, I don't know that it would be enough to dissuade you one way or the other. Good choices. A lot of people don't know the difference at all. They're the choice. So they're both good choices. Again, it's that dark orange color. And I know it's interesting because you get some varietals, right? That are white or purple, um, the different. <laughs> so um, I'd have to even look those up. Um, the general rule of thumb is to get the darker color, but you should be getting uh, vitamin A from all of those sort of choices. But I wouldn't be surprised if the darker orange color has more. Okay. And so are those a better option than potatoes or are they? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a sweet potato is far more nutritious for the vitamin A. Now, a lot of people don't realize that a baked potato, for example, is actually a, a good source of vitamin C, um, which is, you know, people are, it's not the same as frying potatoes, right? I'm not saying go eat French fries. Because <laughs> the high, the frying and, and the French fries are so processed that the vitamin C is almost negligible. But a baked potato in that, in that format is actually a good source of vitamin C. So it, it really depends on how much processing sometimes too, right? Mashed potatoes, are going to have less than a baked potato and fried potatoes are even less but a potato in itself is actually a decent source of vitamin c but for vitamin a by far it's going to be this the sweet potatoes the yams thank you mm -hmm. good questions for the darker vegetables you were talking about carrots and bell peppers is there any change in the nutritional value if they're eaten cooked versus raw excellent question again and a little bit it is true that heating sometimes will destroy some vitamins. Vitamin C can be um, one of those, um, but it, it's really, you'd have to really cook it a lot, but you are gonna get a little less. If you, you are gonna get more if you eat it completely fresh, um, that's true. Uh, but cooking and, and the how much cooking, if you really, really cook it to death, you know, people who still boil their vegetables, you know, instead of uh, steaming or use a microwave are gonna have a little bit less. Uh, there used to be some studies where they, the water from boiling vegetables, they would take how much vitamin is in that water that was seeped out of the vegetable. So it does have an effect. And that's why using less water steaming is better and microwave is actually better to maintain the, than the you know, boiling in water. So it is gonna be a little bit less with cooking, that is true, but it, you're still gonna get good sources. So fresh is best. Thank you. Sure, these are good <laughs> questions. You guys are really <laughs> Uh, is there anything else? Any, no more questions? Okay, um, if you guys need any resources, then you guys can call the community hospice at 209-578-6300, or you can visit hospiceheart.org. Uh, we would like to invite you to our next presentation of Community Connections on May 25th at 12 o'clock. The topic will be the Stanislaus County Family Caregiver Support Program. Wonderful. This video will be available on our Community Hospice YouTube channel. And thank you all for joining. Thank you for having me again.
Thanks so much, Jill. Appreciate You're you. Welcome. Carmen, Thank have you. a lovely day. You too. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye.